Welcome. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate you doing this. This is uh, fantastic to get you at last. Thanks for having me. So I'm just going to jump straight into it. The first time I came across your work was, funnily enough, when I was researching a fighter, a UFC fighter by the name of Ensign Inuo. Have you ever heard of him? No. <laughs> Pride fighter, UFC fighter, beat Randy Couture. Oh, wow. Absolute gorilla. And I shouldn't, I should know. Yeah. Lovely guy, by the way, Ensign, if you're watching. Beautiful, humble man. And as I was doing the research for Ensign, I came across Stomp the Groin. I think it was the, it was the groin hitting video that you've become. Yeah, 100, 100 ways to attack the groin. <laughs> that you've become infamous for. That was the fella. And it was it was very ironic. I'm there researching for this this ultimate fighter who's known he was notorious for being a kind of you know he would fight till his limit, and uh, then I'm, I'm I end up watching you. <laughs> well, that was the video that really took off, didn't it? Yeah, that was the first time we did something that um, I guess we we it was the, the first thing we did that we considered a viral video. Because it was the it was the first video that ever hit a million views, and it, it I think it got to a million views in like a week or ten days, something like that. It it just picked up so much steam, and uh, um, it introduced a lot of people to our channel and our show. And so yeah, it was really just one of the first things we did that seemed to connect with a lot of people, something that made a lot of people laugh, uh, even if they didn't know anything about martial arts or anything about you know, Master Can or anything. That, that one seemed to reach a lot of people. Right. Yeah. Why Why do you think that was? I mean, when I watched it, it seemed it was quick. It was fast. It was very funny. Um, the way you set it up. I mean, we have our theories. Okay. We've done other videos that we thought, oh, man, this one's really going to take off. And then it doesn't. You know, and I've, I've, I've spoken with other YouTubers who have much bigger followings than I do. And, right. And even they will say, Sometimes they just don't, they don't know. They don't know why a particular video um, uh, takes off and why another one doesn't. I will say that uh, there are characteristics of this video that uh, are on the right track. For instance, um, mm. uh, lists, anything with a list, you know, the, t yeah, the, the, click, the clickbaity titles, you know, of like five reasons why or the 10 <laughs> that it was 100 ways to attack the groin. Just the title was good. Um, and then I, I sort of feel like it's also the first video we did that you don't need to uh, speak our language. You know, that's the uh, right. Uh, you could I mean, groin hits are funny no matter what country you're in, no matter who you are. They're just funny. And so uh, people all over the world could watch the video and laugh and they didn't need to understand anything that Ken was saying. So, yeah, I mean, there were a bunch of qualities. It was a quick video. It's only like two minutes long, so it's really shareable. But there was like a bunch of qualities that we can look at it now and be like, oh, yeah, I guess I can see why that's popular. But at the time, we did not expect it to be popular at all. In fact, the only reason we did that video was because we noticed that other channels do some kind of special video at, at their 100th upload. We're like, oh, wow, okay, so we should do something involving the number 100 and our original idea was some stupid thing about having a birthday cake with a hundred candles on it that like started a fire in the dojo or something and we like we came we like came up with that idea and we were like that's really complicated like we're gonna have to do effects and stuff like that and so we said why don't i just hit you in the nuts like a hundred times <laughs> and that was yeah. and so we shot that in one afternoon and cut it a couple days later and, and it became our biggest hit I think it had a very much a crossover, didn't it? That one, it really, like you say, I kind of it worked on so many different levels that it it really was the one that introduced people to Master Ken. Yeah, and it's funny, you know, for people who create content who are looking to get get an audience and looking to build all that stuff. I think one of the lessons we learned there too is that we just have to we just have to keep making content because there's a lot of videos we put a ton of work into that maybe are hit or miss. And you never know what people are going to key into. The key with uh, making content and building an audience is just consistency, just content out and, you know, coming up with an idea, filming it, cutting it, putting it out, and then moving on and just continuing to make stuff because you never know which one is going to be the one. 
yeah. I mean, it's funny actually because there's a a very notorious um, podcaster, kind of life hacker called Tim Ferriss, and he was talking to a guest about this the other day. He says it's it's not only consistency, and they were saying, well, which is the best way to market it? You know, which social media platform? You know, is it film? Is it short form, long form? Is it audio? And he, they said, listen, just make the content good and make it consistent, and then the rest will follow. Absolutely. Absolutely. And make it and make what you want to make. That's the other thing, because if you if you spend too much time chasing trends and popularity and stuff, uh, you'll burn out. You know, you got to you got to make stuff that you actually really like and then just hope that some of it connects with an audience. We've got the um, uh, season four of Enter the Dojo coming up. And I think the first two videos are probably two of the funniest things we've ever done. But at the back of my mind, I'm also prepared like, just because I think it's funny, they're longer videos. The first episode, I think, is about eight and a half minutes, and the second episode right now is is 15 minutes long. I don't really want to break them up into small pieces because I think they work really well the way they are, but I'm prepared for them not to do the viewership that I would prefer because they're not as quick and catchy, you know? Um, but they're great videos. I'm very, very proud of them. So that's another key. You just got to make content that you like. Mm. Uh, first, and then sort of figure out what platforms you get a good response on, how to title it, how to use thumbnails to help you. But but first and foremost, you got to make stuff you like. Follow your bliss, as Joseph Campbell used to say. Definitely, right. Definitely. It's all about what you love to do, because then I think the quality comes to the surface, no matter what it is. And oh yeah, you know, it rings true with your audience. Like if you like it, then 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 that will that will ring true. If you're just doing it to do it and you're kind of, you know, not that into it. I think that comes through. I think whatever you put into your work comes through to the audience. So the more excited about it you are and the more genuine about it you are, the mm. more people will feel that. I think the new thing with social media is honesty, isn't it? The key word is if you, they, people want to see who you are. This is why they're not watching the TV or listening to the radio as much. It's all podcast, YouTube. They really want to see the identity of the person. I think sincerity really makes or breaks a lot of channels. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that, that it took me quite a while to figure out was that, um, in fact, um, in the analytics of the YouTube channel, mm. you, you can see what the most common search terms are mm. for your channel. Right. And, uh, it's not enter the dojo, which, you know, the name of the channel is enter the dojo show. But the number one search term is Master Ken. Um, <laughs> right. People people search for the character because I didn't understand until I was very far into making the show that a lot of social media and video platforms and content in general is personality based. Sure. Um, right. People are connecting with a personality more than a particular narrative. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I have that with podcasts. You know, I'm, I'm listening. I listen to stuff like Serial. I listen to Sword and Scale. And. And it's the it's the the hosts of the show that in, that intrigue me just as much as the content itself. Right. And so, yeah, you have to try to find a way to create content that where people connect with that personality. The odd thing about Ken is that technically he's not a real dude. Um, <laughs> but when I am uh, when I am in character and playing that guy and playing him well. Um, people connect with it and they want, they want to learn more about Ken. They want to talk to Ken. They want to, yeah. when I do live, live appearances and stuff, they want to meet Ken and hear him say something wild, you know? So uh, the, the focus in a way about the show has shifted over the years, realizing that people connect with the personality of Ken just as much as the story. Right. His backstory and his background and who he is and why he is the way he is. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and exactly. It's... And that's something I want to do long term with the character in the channel is like continue to build the origin of Ken, how he became who he is. And, and uh, there's so many fun things we have planned um, connected to that. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, the other side of it is that, as you I'm sure, you know, when you've got your own show and you don't necessarily have a lot of backing, uh, there's a limited amount of time you can sure can put into every every episode every week every month every year and, and so um but but the the direction we have in the long term is definitely to give people way more insight into him because he's such a fun character yeah i agree i definitely think with characters uh, and, and the depth of the character is the important thing i mean for example other podcasts um like joe rogan 
Brian Rose uh, from London Real and Tim Ferriss and probably the king of media has got to be um, <laughs> Howard Stern. <laughs> Howard Stern, there you go. <laughs> See, Synch- synchronicity, there you go, Howard Stern. Is that- you know, listening to my manager, my tour manager who organizes all the Master Ken live uh, appearances, she's a, she's a huge uh, Howard, Stern. Howard Stern fan and yeah. will send me his stuff. And I've, I've always liked him, but like she'll send me specific podcasts of him. And yeah, it's his... Um, his his sincerity in who he is and his faults and his, the fact that he'll talk about the things that he's embarrassed about himself or that he's frustrated or like it's it's that that uh, directness and honesty even in the things that are controversial that is so appealing um, about about him and that's uh, that's something that you know we we strive for again in a weird way with Ken you know that that Ken is is technically fictional, but there's a lot of truth in what he says. And so we're always trying to find, mm. you know, how would Ken react to this in a way that people will connect? I think with Howard Stern, he's, but essentially he reinvented media, didn't he, really? He was the first alternative media guru. He kind of led the oh, way. No, he's, he's fantastic. Yeah. And I love, uh, I was, I was kind of, I was kind of bummed, you know, we did a, we did a stint on, uh, America's Got Talent this year, and we were just so bummed that we missed him by one, I think, one season. I think he did it last season, but he didn't do it this season. And we were like, ah, oh, man, we would have loved to perform for Howard. They didn't know, did they? They You you fooled them into the into the, the character, right? They never, they never, even when uh, we would do calls, I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about it because they made me sign a bunch of stuff, but I will right. say, I will say they never called me by my real legal name, Right. Matt. They always called me Ken. <laughs> and, and so we just, yeah. I, I corrected them like once or twice. And then after the third time they called me Ken, I was like, eh, if, if they don't get it, I'll just, I'll just play along. <laughs> yeah. And just have, have them think that Ken's a real dude who really does Meridote. And, and that's ironically, you know, that has been the strength of Master Ken. It's like the more people think that he's real and take him at his word, the better uh, the show performs, the better our social media gets traffic. Um, the more people play into the illusion of Ken, uh, the better it is for us. Does that help you as well, Matt, like develop the character? Because you do a lot of free form. You're, you're doing stuff on the fly all the time, aren't you? You're improvising, you're thinking, you're, you're going with what they say and then building the character with, you know, in real time. Yeah. And, you know, part of that is just the necessity of the way media works now, like because process uh, of how I used to create things has changed so much. I used to, you know, I went to film school, I got a bachelor's in film and and, uh, we would write a script and then, you know, rewrite it 10 times. And then we would prep a production for for multiple, for many months. Right. Uh, we, weeks or months and then we would shoot and then we would edit for months and then we would promote it for a year. But now... Uh, I have to generate content so regularly Fast, yeah. that there quite honestly isn't, there isn't really a way to write it. I mean, there, I, I certainly, I do write some skits when, when I have time, but so many times we have to do live performances and interviews and, and, or we're, we're behind on our videos and I'm going into the dojo Monday night and I'm like, we got to get something out released by tomorrow. Uh, let's just, you know, let's come up with something right now. And so, yeah, the more I understand the character, the better I am at doing that. But it's kind of something that has developed out of necessity where Mm. I'm just like, I would love to sit down and talk about this idea and rewrite it for a week. But it's got to be online in three hours from now. So we got to just do it. (laughs) So it's something I've learned to uh, to kind of roll with. And and uh, and it's exciting because I never know if it's going to be funny until it comes out of my mouth. I was going to ask you about that because, um, you know, Riff Raff Media, great name, by the way, love that. When you were studying, that was at the Santa Fe Film School. Yes, at, at the time it was called College of Santa Fe. Now it's, uh, they're under new ownership at Santa Fe University, but I got my uh, film degree in 2005, I believe, from there. Got it. When you're developing, what's your process, what's your method, and uh, how, how does that differ from when you were studying? Well, some of it's similar in that uh, when we do the season, you have all the characters, like all the students, and there's a storyline and and a, and a kind of an arc of the narrative and progression of, of everything. And we have a whole crew. We learned in season three that we can't improvise too much because we improvise too much in season three. 
I had become overly confident with our improv skills, realized that at a certain point you do need a script to fall back on. Yeah. Um, we had, we had three episodes that were very, very intensely written by Adam Rotler, who, uh, who directs a lot of the episodes. And then we had three episodes that I just had rough ideas for. And we kind of, the season ended up being very uneven and, and all that. So, um, the process that still relates is now when we do a season, I sit down and I write, I write the scripts. We still always end up improvising write as much of the season as I can ahead of time so that we at least have an idea of where we're going. And so that we can shoot efficiently with a crew of what ends up being about 15 people and make the most of it. Cause we shoot an entire season of enter the dojo in five days. We wow. shoot wow. very, very fast out of necessity. Cause we don't have any, we don't really have a budget and we just kind of like do our best. But as far as the videos that have become the most popular, which are the instructional videos, um, yeah. that's Joe Conway and I, who plays uh, Todd Woodland. That's us going into the dojo and just talking about what exists in the martial arts world, whether it's something trending that people are talk talking about right now, uh -huh. or whether it's just a concept of martial arts that is um, that is that we've both heard as students and instructors mm -hmm. uh, and trying to find a way to relate it to, to a video that can be uh, viewed quickly and easily. Something that can be done in one take that can be uploaded quickly and something that people can understand. Yeah. And so ironically, the, my, my film school training really helps me with the season. And the thing that I would say helps me with the other content is a thing called the 48 hour film project. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Yeah. There's a thing called the 48 hour film project. They do it all over the world. And basically you pay a fee, you put together a casting crew and Friday night you are given parameters. And by Sunday evening, you have to deliver a finished seven minute film from not right. Um, and I, I did that competition for six years wow. and learned how to make something out of nothing very, very quickly. Sure. And some of that was actually some of the best training I got for being a YouTuber because you have to generate content so quickly. Mm. Um, it's totally contrary to a lot of the training that I had in school. And so, right. uh, so I, 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 we still do the seasons every year because I love doing the seasons. It's like making a TV show and I get to apply a lot of the filmmaking craft that I've learned. But as far as the weekly instructional videos, the 48 hour film project was like my boot camp for creating content on the fly, regularly getting it out to an audience. It's almost kind of a turbo charge. I remember when I was at uni, we, when we did our film projects, we had a 24 hour one, you know, a 24 hour, oh, nice. do a three minute, it was only like a short. It's that initiative of the, 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 the extreme speed of, of what you've got to do. It makes you, it just makes you do it. Right. And it kind of ups your game, ups your level. Yeah, because there, there's, you know, you. I'm sure anybody who's ever made films has had that experience of like you, you toil over a project for far too long. And I've done this with episodes of the show. I've done this with other film projects where you sit on a project or you, you toil on it for two years and then you put it out and it's like not that good because like you overthought it and you took too much time and you're like, gosh, that was two years of my life. And now, you know, now it, this just sucks. And now I just have to move on, you know, where I'm not saying that it's not good to plan and it's not good to be meticulous, but you have to have a balance. And, uh, the thing that the, the YouTube, uh, dynamic helps me do is to, is to not be so precious right. about things. Just be like, you know, do your best within the time allotted and then move on and just keep creating. Yeah, I think a lot of tubers talk about that, don't they? That kind of time frame, that those quick deadlines, it actually some and it heightens the game, makes people more creative, and and I think by doing that, uh, a lot of the time, new things grow, new things develop, kind of very organically. Oh yeah, and that your your uh, your concepts evolve uh, into something else, you know, that you never would have yeah. would have thought. I mean, there are plenty of videos we've done that were supposed to be something else, but they kind of morphed sure. into, you know, a whole other idea. But that's part of the fun part, and it is also fun to be limited. I mean, as as weird as it sounds, it's fun to be limited in time and money too, because again, that just forces your creativity to work. If you have too many resources and too much time. Um, it can kill a project because you just you you have the luxury of of yeah. uh, overthinking and overspending and 
And, uh, you know, Joe, Joe and I actually, we got into a rhythm a little while ago uh, of buying props for videos. And at least 50% of the time, those videos didn't do very well. And I was like, man, that video cost me $90 in props and nobody's watching it. And if we keep <laughs> at that pace, we're going to lose money on the show. So it's like whatever is in the dojo, whatever is in the closet, in the supply closet or whatever right. we can find in the back seat of my truck. Yeah. Or you know what I mean? If we need something and we can make it out of scotch tape and, and you know, find in the dojo, do it. But otherwise... Like a pirate hook or a, or a, or a beard or a fake parrot, right? <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? Like we've done, like that video did okay, but that pirate, I think all those pirate things cost like 60 or 70 bucks. And I was like, you know, that video is going to take like three years to break even. <laughs> and and we, we do still have to generate revenue for these. And so we, we do think like, you know, once in a while we'll splurge on some props, but a lot of the time we're just like, it's got to be something we can do easily in the space and just be creative in our, in, in our, with what we have available. And quick, yeah. When you first developed this, what was the reaction from the martial arts community when it first came out? Because some people get you, some people don't. I think now more people are aware after you did a few of your tours what you're doing and, and they know about the Master Ken. But when you first started developing this, did you know there was going to be that much of a backlash? I actually, no, I didn't, I didn't know how people were going to react. And, um, I, I kind of, I don't want to say, I don't want to say I didn't care. I had been to, I had trained with enough master Ken's yeah. that I thought somebody's got to get this. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I can't be the only person who has had this experience in a, in a dojo that I've walked into and taken a couple of classes and been like, Oh my God, this guy's crazy. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, even now, even now though, the, the, the reaction of some people is still, still pretty hostile. It really helps the show. Yeah. That's the crazy thing. It helps the show. I just had, um, I just had a guy, uh, out of nowhere, um, message me and, uh, talk about the, you know, he, he was saying he was a fan and that he wanted to, I can't remember what he, he, appro he approached me like as if he was a big fan of the show. Immediately, he posted some sort of product that he was promoting on the Master Ken page and tried to use Master Ken's following to promote his products. So I had, as Ken, immediately commented on it and said... It's called lifting, isn't it, I think? Yeah, yeah. And I kind of kind of like, I, I, I commented on it as Master Ken and said, why would anyone want to buy your bullshit? <laughs> And he messaged me and he was so mad. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. He doesn't actually know that Ken, he just knows Ken is, is kind of recognizable in the martial arts world. He doesn't know it's you. what this is. And so I trolled him for like seven pages of, of messages, nice. uh, just continuously just needle pricking him. And he got so angry. And there's tons of evidence everywhere that Ken is not a real dude. This guy hadn't, hadn't caught on. And I sort of, I still have the attitude that if somebody thinks Ken is real and they want to get upset about it, then they deserve whatever, whatever gets them upset. Clever. If you're, if you're aware enough and, and have a good enough sense of humor to buy into the satire, then you can, then you get to enjoy it. But if you allow master Ken to upset you, I, I can't, I can't help you. I know like it, it's, it's gotta be, you gotta have a sense of humor. And that goes for, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that have been big fans of Master Ken right up until he makes fun of their martial art. They love it when he says that, you know, I, I've had people that they love it when I say, when Ken says karate is bullshit and kung fu is bullshit. Yeah. But then I say jujitsu is bullshit. And they're like, hey, wait a minute. I do jujitsu. You can't <laughs> say that. About, you know, and I'm like, no, no, no. It's like it's equal opportunity offender. You know, like it was after everybody equally. And that's supposed to be the unifying quality of the comedy is that nobody is safe. Exactly. I love the fact that someone's trolling you and you're trolling them back in character. That's brilliant. Oh, it's so fun. It's like, you know, the angrier, the angrier they get, uh, the more fun it is. And, and so I'm hoping actually to include, I've been writing, a, I've been writing a Master Ken book, uh, and, uh, I got to get permission from some of these folks, but I'm hoping they'll let me include, uh, screenshots of yeah. them being trolled. Cause it's, uh, it's, it's some of the best stuff. And, and that stuff gets, such great traffic on the social media. When I post a screenshot of somebody getting really mad at Master Ken, yeah, God, the fans love it. They love it. 
as a marsh, I've, I've trained most of my life as well. And when I was watching your videos, I could tell that you, you, you know, you've got a background. You know, I think that's what makes it Master Ken so appealing is that you know training, and there's a lot yes. of there's a lot of overlap with that, isn't there? With the character, with the way you train, the way you the way you move, there's an authenticity of a martial artist, someone who obviously has got a background in training, but at the same time, you understand the irony and, uh, you know, just use it in such a way that it's so convincing to some people, other people get it. And I think there's that weird margin where people are kind of in the middle. Yeah. I feel like that is what has made the show popular amongst martial artists is that they know that I am not just an actor or a comedian who doesn't know martial arts, who is making fun of something that they really have dedicated their lives to. I have also dedicated uh, a good portion of my life to training in martial arts. And I'm definitely a hobbyist. I was never, um, you know, much of a competitor at tournaments. I never really aspired to be like a professional fighter or anything like that. Uh I just, I loved martial arts movies. Um, I needed um, discipline when I was a teenager. I, I was kind of, you know, had a, a had an attitude problem and, and martial arts was something that helped me focus and helped me become a better person. And it's something I've always enjoyed being connected to, but I think it is the legitimacy of the, uh, of the fact that I do train and have been training since I was, I think, 16 years old in the martial arts. And a lot of these things that I'm poking fun of uh, are things I've really experienced as training in martial arts. And, and, uh, and I actually have really enjoyed, in fact, uh, there was a period of time where I had been making fun of martial arts so much that I didn't have time to train in it. And uh, that's changed this year. I finally went back to uh, training. I've been training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I have some friends who do Hap Keto, and I've been doing some of that and really enjoying it. And the more plugged into my love of the martial arts that I am, mm-hmm. the more content I think of to, to joke around with people about. And, and one of the most encouraging things is when I go into classes that I've never gone into and everybody, rec- you know, people recognize Master Ken, they want a picture and they want to say how much they love the show and how much they love the, that I make, you know, that in the creation of the show that we make them laugh. Sure. And, uh, and so, yeah, but yes, the legitimacy of being someone, I love martial arts. Um, I, I, I love continuing to study and train and read about it and do all these things. And, um, and so I think that's why the show works is because I'm not just, I, it's not all about being mean spirited. It's about, uh, making people laugh about mm. the sometime, the somewhat absurdity of it, yeah, of, of the world of martial arts. Exactly. I think a lot of martial artists like it. Uh, mm. Some who are more aware, maybe, because it's a reflection of themselves, and I think they get that. I, the, you know, the 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 ironicness of it. They can see that a lot of these people take themselves very seriously, don't they? And I think, including themselves, like there are people who have said. Uh, oh my God, like, you know, I love your show, but then they'll like, Ken will say something and they'll be like, wow, I've said that in class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. I know a few of those as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? Uh, Matt, it always seems to be Aikido. Uh, you've only got to hear what Bass Rutan and Joe Rogan think about it. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, um, it's no shortage of content. In fact, when people, when people make, when people say, when are you going to, you know, you got to stop picking on martial artists. I, I tell them when you stop giving me material, I, every time I think we've run out of things to say, um, somebody will send me a video and I'll go, Oh my God, I got to make fun of this. You know, like there's just too much, that's even worse too much silliness between like the no touch knockout stuff and, mm. and, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the McDojo stuff. And there's, there's just a lot of very, very funny things in the martial arts world that uh, just give us ammunition over and over and over again. Exactly. There was a bizarre one. I think it was Aikido and the guy was just, just, just staring at people and putting his hand up and it was all very Darth Vader and they were flying around the room. Oh, yeah. I know the guy. Yeah. I know that many people like, and that's the thing when that stuff comes out, like hundreds of messages, people just all send me the same video. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so if we've already made fun of it, then I'll be like, yeah, I've seen it. But then there are times when somebody will send me something and I'll go, okay, that's good. Thanks for sending it. We're going to make a video about that. That's kind of fun. Cause it's an ongoing conversation between ourselves and our audience about what we all find funny. Uh, people who are not trying to be funny. 
serious. <laughs> but then what I find really interesting is as uh, the character has developed and you've progressed with the videos, you find a lot of the professional martial artists, the high-end guys, the UFC fighters, uh, people like, uh, I think it was, I think it was it Hoist Gracie, you did a, you did a, you were doing a tour and you did a show with him there. Was that the one I saw on yeah, YouTube? we did uh, at um, uh, Tony Pillage's place. Um, oh, shoot. What is the name of the... I want to say it's like something like Peaceful Warrior. I'll have to look it up here. Um, okay. But uh, uh, yeah, it was one of, that was one of the first uh, live shows we did. And um, uh, we did... Uh, it was one was at a, a gentleman, uh, Mr. Crittenden's place. I forget what town that was in. And then our second show was at Tony Pillage's place. And Hoist Gracie gave uh, gave a seminar in the morning <laughs> that I was supposed to do. And I part of my beginning, my opening bit was to make fun of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I was like, oh, man, Hoist Gracie's going to be standing right behind me. And he loved like, it. He loved it, though, didn't he? He, he laughed. And that's the thing. Yeah, he had a good attitude about it. Like, you know, and I just met, uh, I, I, I've, met a, I've met a few of the Gracie's and taking pictures with them and like they come up and tell me that they like the show and that blows my mind because I've been watching them since I was, you know, I, you know, the original UFC and all that stuff. So when those guys say they like what 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 we're doing with the show, that's when I get starstruck. So I'm like, oh man, these guys that inspired me to study martial arts enjoy what we're doing. Like that's incredible. Yeah. I think they like it though because it, it they probably think the same thing because they come across a lot of people. You know, if you see the early Gracie uh, fights when they, they used to challenge people in Long Beach and all that and they used to come in and it was it was those guys, wasn't it? It was the sort of Kung Fu style guys, the, the, guy, the guys that had somehow convinced themselves they were sort of Buddhist monks and they could levitate. You know, it was, the, it was those fellas. Oh, yeah, yeah. They went in and, you know, like just proved that that was the stuff I grew up watching was the Gracie in action tapes, you know, and sure. and all that stuff of them going in and, and basically saying, you know, uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu is the best in the world and we're willing to prove it. We'll go in and, and all you got to do is knock me out. And then they would take these guys down and just destroy them. And, uh, you know, of course, it was before anybody knew Jiu Jitsu. Now it's a different game in a way. But I, yeah. I find that people like the Gracies, people like the UFC fighters, um, they are the most open to joking around they are so secure because they know that they are great fighters they know that their stuff works they have put themselves out there as warriors and um they have incredible confidence in what they can do and uh they are not threatened by the comedy threatened about it by all, uh, at all so so they they are some of the most fun people to joke around with because um the, nothing that master ken can say will will threaten their confidence in themselves whereas yeah. whereas some other martial artists um who are maybe a little <laughs> a little <laughs> insecure about whether or not their stuff works or or whatever um uh tend to get more upset uh, about the uh, you know can offending the tradition and sanctity of blah 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 blah, blah like you know and, and, <laughs> and, and there and 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 that's great too for a different reason <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. With a lot of those, 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 those top end fighters, it, like you say, it's, it's confidence, isn't it? It's just that pure confidence that they have where they, they love the fact that someone's taking it lightheartedly and they, they recognize the irony, you know? Um, oh, absolutely. They, and yeah, yeah. I mean, they'll, they're the guys who are like, if someone's like that wouldn't work, they're like, let's, let's see, let's, let's step in the ring and, you know, show me that it won't work or show me, you know, like they have such confidence in their skill and their ability and their and their willingness to fail, too. That's the other thing is like being a fighter. I have such incredible respect for them. Like, you know, like uh, uh, wh whatever you compete in or like, you know, being in that world, like you have to risk that you're going to lose. And there are a lot of people who won't put themselves in that position of, hmm. of losing and being embarrassed or, or, you know, like losing a fight. But if you have the courage to step in and risk losing. What else are you going to be afraid of? Like that vulnerability makes you so uh, strong. Exactly. And that's the thing I have the most, uh, most respect for, you know, getting to meet and work with people like Michelle Watterson. She is one of, she's one of our favorite people to have on the show, the karate hottie. She is so funny and mm -hmm. so sweet and, 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 and yet really confident because she has incredible ability as a fighter. And, uh, you know, people like her, people like Keith Jardine, um, uh, you know, when they come in and make appearances on the show, Greg Jackson has been on the show. Like all those guys are so confident 
um, because they put themselves out there on a regular basis. Sure. You've got Cynthia Roth Rock as well. That was quite, I enjoyed oh, yeah, that. She's awesome. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, people who have proven themselves time and time again. Cynthia's great. She's such a fan of the show and she's so fun to work with. Um, got a, she's got a great sense of humor. And, um, and so, yeah, the, the more, the more prestigious people we get on the show, the more flattered we are that they'll give us the time of day. And, uh, and the thing is the, 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 the more, uh, more of an, ex, uh, su- uh, successful, impressive career they have, usually the more humble they are. You're a big Ricky Gervais fan, aren't you, Matt? I am. He was, he was one of the guys who really kind of, yeah. I was aware of the mockumentary format, but mm-hmm. I watched, um, I the- think two ep- Two episodes, or maybe not two episodes. I think I watched the full episode. The Office. Of The Office before I realized it wasn't real. And I was, <laughs> and I was like, God, I totally just fell for this. Like, I, I just was watching this being like. Oh, you're so American, Matt. God. Yeah, oh, I couldn't believe it. I was fascinated by it. And I watched that show obsessively. I bought all three. I bought the, the two seasons and the Christmas special. And I literally watched that, like, every night for a year. Yeah. I was just, I thought it was the most brilliant thing I'd ever seen. And, um, and I'm such a huge fan of Ricky's. I have such immense respect for, for his work, yeah. uh, him and Steven Merchant, of course. And, um, and I, I just decided after seeing that, after like watching it for a year, I was like, I want to do this. Um, I just got to figure out a way to do it in a way that I relate and ultimately said it settled on, uh, on martial arts because that was something I was doing at the time. And thought, well, I've been doing this for a while and like to do the office in a dojo and just see if people get it. And so that was a big part of the inspiration. Yeah, I think that's what a lot of people do. They put all their attributes together and you've somehow managed to hinge them and make them work, which is, which is, you know, art form in its best, really. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and the crazy thing is it's really evolved. I mean, you know, when we started, it was very much the office in a dojo. But, um, you know, the little, what, what has really taken off are the offshoots of the show. The instructional videos that we do are really, those are like 75% of the views we get on the channel are, are the little snippets of Ken trying to teach self-defense. Like that stuff gets the most traffic. So even though I still love the original concept, and of course we have season four coming out in, in the spirit of previous seasons, um, the show has definitely evolved from what it started what i love about the gervais stuff he really was one of the first people to make the documentary style a lot of steady cam work um the very uncomfortable silent moments that the kind of yeah. that, that very kind of english uh irony which yeah. it, which is so subtle i mean english office american office you prefer the english one right yeah i do i've seen some of the american office and it's even interesting if you watch the first few episodes episode one of the american office is very very close to the original the first episode of ricky's but you notice that very quickly they began to realize that american audiences aren't the same as as uh english audiences because the the tone seems to shift uh noticeably in my opinion notice they they thought they were just going to kind of do a shot for shot remake and it didn't really I don't know. It didn't seem like it plays as well. Sure. I mean, it seems like the American show really took on a life of its own. And that's a great show in its own right. Sure. But I definitely, um, I, have a, I have a preference of, of Ricky's stuff, you know. And, of course, his other shows are great, too. I, I really enjoy extras and Life's Too Short. But I, I, um, uh, the, the original Office will still always be one of the most... Um, inspiring things that I've watched. I think it's funny. Bill Hicks said the same about his, about his shows, about his certainly his later stuff where he said that actually he'd got a bigger following in the UK than he did towards the end in the U S. Yeah, it's, it, there is a very particular kind of, and honestly that's kind of happened again. That's another thing that I feel like has really happened with our show is that we used to, our biggest viewership used to be in the UK. And uh, being at all the analytics, we weren't that well known in the States, but the UK latched onto us immediately. Uh And now finally, five years later, it has swapped. Now our biggest audience is is in the US and then our second is is the UK. And um, it's funny how and, and, and I do attribute it to some of the tone switching of our show too because some of our comedy has changed some of the type of content we do has changed uh-huh. and i feel like it's 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 connected more with an american audience now 
Right, I got it. One of the little critiques I love about uh, R- Ricky's work is is uh, the look at the camera, which I know you you also do. <laughs> like, the little, yeah, yeah, that is one of my favorites, and that's and and it's great for it's something that yeah, that a lot of the actors like doing. I love a lot it. Of the, in fact, when we're shooting, uh, they'll have a little conversation about who is going to look at what camera when, and they'll give us <laughs> multiple versions of like, so that we can choose in the scene when they look at the camera, like what will be the funniest? Do they look yeah. immediately after Ken says something weird or do they wait for 10 seconds and then at the very end of the scene, stare at the lens? Like mm. we have experimented with that a lot. That's something that, that being able to talk directly to the camera, in fact, honestly, it was a habit I had to get out of because I didn't work as an actor. Yeah, you know, you never look at the camera, yeah. Yeah, oh my God, that is like the one thing you should never do. And there were times when if I sort of flub a line or I kind of miss my mark, I have that impulse to just look right into the lens and be like, whoops. Um, yeah. and it's like you can't do that on, on, on bigger movies and TV shows. They'll look at you like you're crazy. So I have to kind of like remind myself when I'm on other people's shoot, shoots, like, okay, don't do that. Don't, don't break the wall. <laughs> exactly. But it is the funniest thing in the world. If you look at the outtakes from The Office, it's always when he does the look. It's the 45 angle to the camera. It's that self-doubting. He knows what he said is wrong. But at the right. same time, it's that pause. Uh, one of my favorite Ricky Gervais's lines is the boots. You can still get them. Uh, yep. <laughs> Dolly Parton quote. Yeah, can, can, the, can you remember that one? one where, he said, uh, where he says, "If you want to, if you want a rainbow, you have to put up with the rain." Dolly Parton said that, and people think she's just a big pair of tits. <laughs> <laughs> he, he looks right into the camera. That actually, that outtake is one of my favorite outtakes because he, you can see how difficult it was for him to say that line and, and not, and not yeah. crack up. I, you know, Rick, Ricky's got the most outrageous laugh, and you know, if you look at the outtakes of that, him and Stephen Merchant, he's like. I, I just, I can't stand you, you know, he yeah. said, and, and then they, they start free forming and it's just like, you're actually, I, 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 and he just walks out, you know, and it's actually yeah. almost as funny as the show itself. Yeah, there's, I, I, I agree. I agree. And I actually, I kind of wish we could show more of that because we have quite a bit, we have quite a lot of outtakes. The weird thing about our relationship or just the unique thing about our relationship with our audience is that even though a lot of people who watch, the majority of people who watch do know that we're creating an illusion with the character of Ken, they don't like to see us break character. <laughs> um, we, we started posting outtakes, I think, in season two. Wow. And they didn't get very good viewership. And some of the fans really kind of said they didn't, they didn't like us breaking the illusion. So we kind of started to get away from that. And it's too bad because I love outtakes in other TV shows and movies. And we have a lot of really funny ones. But when we when we do break the illusion, um, people tend not to like us. So we hide that stuff. Uh, that's strange because I, I know that when the when the uh, little extra scenes come out in the UK, they 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 sometimes they sell more than the original release because right. we want to see it. We I like seeing the development. I like seeing the way they the process, the method, you know, the, the writing, the the behind the scenes, you know, the way Stephen and Ricky work together and their fuck ups and their, you know, and right. it, it, it's hilarious. It's some of my favorite stuff too and I I really get into it. But yeah, I want I I want our audience to want that because I love the I love the behind the scenes stuff, but the more we dispelled the illusion of what we were creating, the more they would kind of get uppity about it and I was like, "Okay, fine. We'll just play it like Ken is a real dude." <laughs> sure. One of my other favorite ones I've got to mention is when he's after the the infamous dance. It's the other guy that he doesn't like very much and he he, he ends up Neil memorized i swear to yeah. god I, I love that show so much yeah it's it's frightening little geeks we are we can remember every like but i i love it and he buys the same jacket as him yeah. and uh you've got that bit where uh you know he just does a dance and it's his birthday and uh gets out the birthday cake oh it's a bit sweet now i i prefer a flan <laughs> <laughs> i love that same that same storyline where he comes in and kind of favors his head uh, towards Dawn to show that he's got an earring. Oh, yeah. And he's like, he's ma- he manages to be cool about it for like 30 seconds. And then she's like, it's bleeding. And he's like, it really stinks. It really stinks. <laughs> <laughs> and he has to admit that he probably shouldn't have stabbed through his ear to, to create, put his earring back in. But like all that type of humor um, just kills me. And I just, I watch it over and over again. And it's, it's being a... 
it's being a fan of comedy and being a fan of martial arts, um, first and foremost, that inspires us to, to do the stuff that, that we do. I think, I think that's another thing that rings true is that, you know, we love mockumentary. We love comedy. We love, uh, you know, uh, English humor. We, we, we love martial arts and we kind of just blend it all together. I think when they're all done at that level, they all become kind of art forms and they all become sort of part of the same thing to an extent, don't they? And you can, oh, cut sure. I've always found that with the most of the stuff I've watched, you know, Seinfeld, Larry David, Gervais, yeah. Merchant, Hicks, all of them, they all seem to have that, that kind of thinking, you know, they, they jump from one thing to another. They're very holistic. Um, Absolutely. Big fan of uh, Gervais. I love the uh, the look. Do you know what that's actually called, Matt? It's called. Uh, is it corpsing? Is that what it's called? Oh no no no! When they look at the camera, when they do the the the. Oh no! The 40... Corpsing is when they screw up in the in the tape, right? Corp, they call corpsing. What, what is it? What is it when they look at the camera? He talks about it, and it's called the burn. The burn. When you look at the camera, what you do with with Ken, you know the into the camera into the lens. Yeah. that's called the burn, and. Origin, like it. Originally, it comes from Lauren Hardy. No kidding. Yeah. If you look at Lauren Hardy, you watch you watch him do it. The bigger one. Was it Stan? Oh, I should know the answer to that. <laughs> I, was a Stooge, I was a Stooges fan myself. Right. Well, if, <laughs> if, if you look at Lauren Hardy, and uh, they, they invented the burn, apparently. No kidding. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. so cool. I, uh, no, I didn't know what it was called, but now I'm Just, totally, I'm going to tell Joe. Tell Todd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's that, that's where it came from that's a great technique it's so cool and it's it's been so fun to you know it's even been weird you talk about influencing like i've gone back and watched um stuff just because you know more and more stuff is available online and on different platforms and stuff i go back and i watch you know movies that i watched when i was a kid that i haven't seen forever or old three stooges clips or yeah. Abbott and costello or more recent stuff like you know uh chevy chase movies or his you know his stuff from that era of, of snl and i will see um how much that shaped my interest in particular techniques or jokes or comedy like stuff will come up that i didn't even realize um was from from that era you know, we'll be, we'll be doing t certain types of slapstick or certain types of jokes. And I'm like, Oh, that's where I got that. That's, that was an old, that was an old Stooges thing. You know, that was something that, that, you know, Mo used to do to Curly or something like that. You know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it, it's like a lot of it's just ingrained in my mind now. It's amazing, isn't it? Some of the more recent stuff ages quicker, but the older stuff never seems to. I was always a fan growing up watching, um, Howard Lloyd. I don't know that. I don't know that guy. Yeah, Har Harold Lloyd. Yeah, he was. Uh, he's the guy you see with the glasses. He was hanging off the the building and. Boy, not Buster Keaton. Buster didn't Harold Lloyd do that as well? I know Buster. I don't know. I don't know who. This, I don't know. I got to look this guy up. Harold Lloyd. Har Har Harold Lloyd. Yeah. I haven't. It, I haven't seen his. I think he did the one where you've got the old sort of uh, car and he's wind, you know, we used to wind them up from the front and a, a train going full speed just hits the car off the tracks and he's still holding the, you know, the, the, the handle of the thing that winds up the engine, you know? Oh, okay. No, now I'm, I just looked him up. I just Googled his, yeah. Now his image is, uh, his, his picture is, is very familiar. It says he was, uh, He's in the same kind of category as as Buster Keaton, but he's uh, so I gotta look up I gotta look up his stuff. Incredible. I mean, if you see the stunts that he used to do, they they were all real, and he had no you know there was no obviously CGI, no stuntmen, and he's all doing it in real time. It's unbelievable. And he would uh, you know just fall off of buildings and the, onto a floor. You know, <laughs> I love I, I love that I love that type of stuff too. I, I feel like I feel like that level of dedication is something that is yeah. unique and, and maybe, you know, I almost feel like sort of the downside of the effects and things like that. Um, I'm certainly happy that we have the technology that we have, but I feel like there is a real commitment that a lot of, um, a lot of people make in the martial arts world. They don't have necessarily have to make in the world of, of comedy when it comes to physical comedy. You look at somebody, how many bones uh, Jackie Chan has broken. In, in creating all the films that he created and that the fact that there are performers that have been so dedicated that they will literally risk their, their safety 
to entertain people. And I feel like there's, there's, I just think that's so incredible. Filming was remarkable. I mean, you would never be able to do any of that now, would you? And talking of CGI, you know, Star Wars, the second three. Oh, uh, I was interviewing a guy who, uh, who was friends with the guy that, did Jar Jar Binks his ears? And I was like, oh, yeah. Did you ask him to leave? You know, the new Star Wars now, they're going back to that kind of old school filmmaking, you know, going back to Pinewood. And I think that's uh, a great thing when, when they get that right. For sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, again, I, I, the, the, the advances in technology that have been made that make it easier, us, uh, easier for us to film, uh, like the, the affordability of digital cameras, the accessibility of nonlinear editing systems on very fast computers and all of that, as well as online distribution platforms that are free and that reach everybody like YouTube, Vimeo, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, all that stuff. That, all, that stuff is all uh, fantastic. But yeah. I do think it is pretty cool um, when you see examples of whether it's action stars or stunt people. I know a lot of amazing stunt people who risk their lives uh, to entertain uh, all of us. And when I see that level of commitment in creating something, I feel like that makes the work uh, even more important. You know, obviously we want people to be safe uh, as best they can, but I also think there's a real courage in, uh, in doing something that is, uh, that is kind of shocking uh, and dangerous in order to entertain people. I think there's something really, really cool about that. Can I jump into uh, some of your kind of uh, film film methods? What do you like? What do you use technically? What what kind of cameras do you guys use, and what do you edit with? And oh yeah, so for the uh, for the weekly the the uh, the short clips, the instructional videos, we shoot on the uh, Lumix uh, GH4. Okay, which is pretty much you know the most affordable. 4k dslr on the market right now uh -huh. uh, and I'm, i've been really happy with it um if i was going to get something else i probably would have gotten the sony a7s just because that that camera is so good uh with its low light performance but uh, i didn't really know much about that camera before i got the gh4 uh, uh -huh. and it's also i think it's twice as much i think it's like almost three grand whereas you can get the gh4 for like i don't know 1600 bucks or something. right um a micro lens mount. So we do a, I adapt it to Canon because I previously we were shooting on uh, the 7D, right. Canon 7D, which is a great camera. So I use Canon lenses um, and uh, we record sound separately to an H4N zoom recorder. So we have nice clean sound for anybody who's looking to create their own content. That's absolutely the most important thing. Like even if you shoot your show on your phone, you can totally shoot it on your phone. Just have good sound. Sure. Um, we usually run two microphones um, in case one fails because we've had nights where we've done some really, really good work and not realized it until later that there was a problem with the microphone and we don't have good sound. So we run two separate channels, two separate mics. Right. Um, and uh, that's our basic setup. We had lighting installed in the dojo because um, I used to bring my lighting kit over and take an hour to light it every time we were going. And I was like, you know, we shoot all the time. We should probably just install some stuff. So we have lighting installed in the dojo that we just walk in, hit a couple of switches and we're ready to shoot. Cause that's, that's the other thing is like, as you get on a release schedule where you're regularly uh, delivering content to an audience, you just want to streamline the process as much as you can. Uh -huh. um, I have, I have uh, uh, for instance, in my editing software we use the adobe suite the creative cloud so i edit on premiere and i do the okay. green screens and after effects um but i have timelines that are just set up with the graphics and the music and the transitions just like right there just so i can just drag and drop simplify the process of getting the content out um because that was what i found was that i was getting buried in the editing process all the time because sure. that takes five five times longer than it does to shoot okay. so um streamlining that process but I've, I've been very very happy with the adobe suite um pretty much once final cut i was a final cut guy for years until they make the change right yep as soon as they <laughs> made the big change like i talked to my editor friends and they were like i'm what? going with adobe so a few people went with avid but most people went with adobe and i was like okay i guess it's time for me to learn a new system and i learned it and i've been incredibly happy with it ever since yeah i, uh, I use premiere yeah yeah I, I love it i think it's a great program and i love the uh dynamic linking, you know, being able to open stuff up in other programs and then, you know, see the yeah. changes in my timeline in real time. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah. So we use that. And then when we shoot the show, we go a little bit higher end. Um, see now I'm not going to be able to remember the name. It's the Sony Corey Weintraub who shoots, who is the DP for the seasons. Uh, uh, he shoots 
on I want to say an FS7. I could I don't think it's the 700. Uh, Corey, if you hear this, I'm sorry that I don't know, but uh, mm-hmm. definitely a higher end camera. And we all and the B camera is the Black Magic. Oh, nice. The two, the, the 2K version of the Black Magic, the pocket cam. And uh, so that, that we shoot, we shoot with those on the actual season, just to try to give us a bit more dynamic range and a bit more of a professional kind of look. But we only have to do that once a year. Right. Uh, the rest, the rest of the time, it's just the GH4, the H4N, a couple of shotgun mics, a couple yeah. of Canon lenses, and um, and we just go in and shoot as much as we can. Going into the sort of, if I can, the kind of biohacking, life hacking, uh, chill kind of routine, you know, um, apart from obviously the, the the production, what do you do personally to keep shape? You've obviously got a background in martial arts and training. What what kind of fitness do you do? What's, what's your diet like? What, what would your, you know, how do you motivate yourself? How do you reach these goals? How do you keep yourself sort of progressing? I'll tell you the best motivation is seeing yourself on camera every week. <laughs> nice. Because if I become a fat ass, I have a front row seat to it. If I if I put on five or six or seven pounds, I can see it immediately uh, in the lens, and I'm like, okay, chubby, let's get let's let's get your ass out and and start running again. So I I am a runner. I try to run uh, every morning, and um, I do lift weights uh, several times a week, and then it's training. You know, before it was uh, American Kempo, that was my art for many years. And now it's been uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Just staying on schedule with those three activities is about all I can handle. Because because uh, doing the show, as well as working on other people's shows, uh, fills up my schedule like crazy. So the best thing for me to do is to run and or lift weights first thing in the morning so that no matter what happens during the day, my workout is already done. Um, cause, cause whenever I say, well, I'll, I'll hit the weights, I'll run at noon, I'll run at lunchtime or I'll lift weights after lunch. Right. It almost, it almost never happens. So that's the, for me, it's, it's been good to work out first thing in the morning, whether it's a, whether it's going out and running a few miles or whether it's lifting weights, uh-huh. that is always the best routine for me. And then to be committed to, uh, to a class, um, and financially committed to a class that actually helps me. Like if I sign up, people gripe about contracts at dojos. I think it's good for me to, to be locked in and be like, well, I'm paying for it regardless. So I better go, <laughs> you know, sure. uh, and then also picking a place that isn't too far away. Um, uh, you know, just so that I, I can't come up with an excuse not to go, you know, try to have a dojo that's within 10 or 15 minutes of my place so that I can't have the argument that I, ah, oh, I would go, but I'm going to be late. You know, it's like have a place close by. And have a and try to pick a dojo that has people you like in it. You know, I mean, that's it's it's. I know everybody wants to pretend they're a badass that's there to become a, a you know a lethal street fighter, but you know, it's it should be it should be fun to go to a dojo, and you should like the people you're training with. You should like your instructor, and uh, it should be something that makes you want to go to class. And as long as I have that experience, I'm I'm game. Yeah. A, a, maybe maybe a master Ken's facilitating that that gap, you know, between oh, sure. <laughs> you know the psychosomatic metaphor of your alter ego. Yeah, well, I tell pe- I do tell people that uh, if there is a character that is much more myself, it's Anthony, the or the skeptical orange belt. He's more the guy who is more like Matt Page. Yeah, uh, who is you know kind of looking over at this crazy instructor, being like. I don't know why we're doing this or no, I'm not going to let you just hit me like hit him. Like, you know, like I'm, I'm the guy that's more skeptical in real life, you know? So the voice of the audience, um, the, the character that the audience relates to through Anthony is definitely much closer to something I relate to. When you set up the class, you know, a, a little bit like the office, you know, they have, they have opposing characters to give it depth and, and, and sort of a, a multi-layeredness, which defines the master Ken as well. Yeah, and also it was my experience in dojos. Like I based I based characters in the show off of people I had. There are certain archetypes that are in every dojo. There, you know, the character of Rachel. Um, I've seen that woman who probably has a, a genuine reason to be fearful or uh, or or uh, kind of standoffish with with men. You know, probably from a very genuinely uh, difficult experience or multiple experiences. But it's a comedy, so we're going to overdo it. And, and make it a bit more than it should be and not really explain why she's got such issues. 
Um, well, you know, I've, I've trained with the diligent brown belt who will take as much punishment as he <laughs> needs to uh, from the instructor, no matter how yeah. how debilitating the the experience is. Yeah. And, I've, and I've and I've trained with with uh, with many Cynthia's who are like, you know, so timid, and you're just so worried for them whenever they have to do techniques or anything, and like, you know, and yet you realize that it probably is something that gives them some much needed confidence in their daily lives. So, so a lot of those archetypes are, when I sat down to write the show, I just thought immediately of people that I have trained with yeah, and, and then thought of the actors that I have worked with for years and just started to assign roles. I think in a lot of gyms and especially dojos, because of the sort of Asian influence of respect and hierarchy, it's almost like a microcosm of society itself, isn't it? You get these different dynamics in these groups and they all seem to be in those kind of gyms. Yeah, and those are the types of things again that 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 co- go to the relatability of the show. Is that you know if you've if, if, if they, you you can see those characters and say I know that guy or I, I've worked with that woman. Yeah. I know I know who that is, and that that makes it even funnier. Yeah, the person who wants a friend or a mate, or he's lacking a father figure, or you know the other guy who's there maybe to flirt or just be a tough guy, and then everything in between. Yeah, and that, you know, and that's something again. I know we've been talking, we've been building up Ricky Gervais a lot, but I, I just, um, he was such an important influence on me. I just have to give him more credit too, is that the finesse with which he, uh, uh, gave David Brent vulnerability. Sure. Um, that scene at the end of the first season where he is going to lose his job and, and his voice cracks a bit and he is, uh, uh, or no, it's at the se- second season, right? It's at the end of the second season. That's right. Yeah, yeah, because of the the uh, because uh, it's with him and him and Neil, I think. But uh, him and Neil and uh, and the uh, the woman that that uh, higher up in the company. But when he shows that level of vulnerability, that's it's nice. so subtle and yet it's so powerful because he really didn't give us a lot of chances to feel bad for for David Brent. But when he does, it was so effective. Mm. And that's the kind of storytelling I really respect because it's so restrained and it's so effective. Just very subtle. Just when you think, you know, him, bang, you, there's another layer. And yeah. And allowing, I, and allowing us, we, I think we've all had moments like that in our lives. We decide we don't like somebody or we have a problem with somebody. And then we see their humanity and we go, Oh man, you know, it's like, he's just like me. Yeah, he's just like me. He's got he's got insecurities. He's got frustrations. He's he's having a tough day. And and who am I? Who am I to judge this person? You know. And like when you can convey that, I think it's so powerful. Yeah, with that's when the new management come in and he's saying the wheels have been set in motion. He goes, "Well, stop him." And he's exactly. That intense. And, and, yeah, gosh, I like I, whenever I watch that, I just I, I that really just gets to me. That it really it's it's such a powerful scene and and that type of that type of acting and writing. Um, just inspires me. It really does. I think that that's the sort of key to a delivery, like like a joke, like a good stand up, isn't it? Where you know, one minute you're very sincere, and then the next minute he will just right at the end they drop a bomb. Ricky Gervais, I think, is uh, is kind of a master at that, isn't he? Was it was it the Golden Globes or the Baftas when he was presenting? Oh, the Golden Globes. But it was very clever. He would he would set you up. I mean, when he's talking about Stephen Hawkins on one of his shows, yeah. you know, and he's going, "Oh, that fake American accent, or oh, what a wanker!" And, and it's just, and it just when you just when you think talking about, he just pulls the rug from under you, and, and there's the laugh. Oh, totally. And the things. I mean, the uh, I don't know what it did for. I, I, I honestly wonder about the behind the scenes of what it what it does for him to uh, to say the things that he says at the Golden Globes because they are so outrageous but um they're also you know they're, they're a lot of things that are probably what and oftentimes are probably true and and uh there's a real uh i feel like that's that's been an interesting state of comedy nowadays is that there is a kind of almost social responsibility of comedians to push the envelope to talk about things that are that are true, that are right in front of us, that people are acting like, you know, that aren't happening or like, you know, risking offending somebody or risking saying something that is um, that is edgy, you know, or, or that, that confronts us with a particular truth. Um, I think all of that is really important. Pushing those envelopes is uh, is kind of 
more important than it has been in a long time. It's not just about getting a laugh. It's about saying something that's so true that you're kind of shocked that Ricky said it. Yeah, I, th- I think Bill Hicks talks about that a lot as well, doesn't he? About you know, essentially, you know, comedians are not just comedians; they're the new political voice of the people, and you know, they're almost like politicians, but they can say and do whatever the fuck they want. And I Absolutely. think that's why they become so powerful now because they've actually, you know, become a, a voice. And and they're a much needed voice in a. I mean, it's it's weird. How it, it is it is absolutely weird about how they don't need to lie. Yeah, they and and in fact, people go to comedy like they go they watch comedy shows to get their news because like the, the some of some of the news outlets are just so strange now. They like things seem so sensationalized. Um, the Buzzfeed, yeah, and, and it's hard. You know, people sometimes trust comedians more than they trust journalists. It's a very very strange time. But but I think it's kind of an awesome responsibility too that a comedian can can say, well, you know. We're not supposed to talk about this, so let's talk about it. The Ricky Gervais joke I love is where, this is one of his uh, live events, uh, Rosa Parks, she goes, oh, Rosa Parks, she did so much for, you know, for, for obviously black rights, you know. She, right, right. You, you know, she was there on the bus and uh, she got onto a, onto a, onto a, a, a white person-only bus and she sat in the seat and uh, they came up to her and they said, listen, you know, you've got to move, you've got to get off the bus. And, um, and, and she said no. Um, and then she started using the disabled seat. <laughs> not having the right change for the driver jesus right. build you up right no he does that in so many ways i mean his, his so uh, subtle his, his jokes about obesity you know and 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 his frustration with, with how you know like you're not allowed to tell somebody who maybe isn't eating so well and isn't exercising that they should do those things you know and like him making a whole routine off of off of that and and uh his yeah no a lot of his uh his yeah. comedy uh, tour stuff. I've watched a lot, watched and listened to a lot of that too. And I take, I take a lot of cues from him. I really, I mean, mm. you know, I'm inspired by a lot of comedians. I love uh, Mitch Hedberg. And as you mentioned, Bill Hicks and uh, you know, uh, even some of the blue collar guys like Ron White and, and all of them and, and the classic guys, you know, I've been listening to growing up, listening to Robin Williams and inner dice clay and Eddie Murphy and oh. all those guys, like they've all been influences yeah. Um, on me. And, and I love that. I love that some of their most famous stuff and the stuff that puts them on the map or like endears them to people is some of their most controversial stuff, the stuff you're not supposed to talk about. And they do it and they do it bravely. Tom Kennison's another one, isn't he? When he talks about marriage. Tom Kennison. See, you're giving me these. I got to look these up. Tom uh, Kennison. He's one of Joe Rogan's favorites. He, uh, great bit on, uh, on marriage, but Andrew Dice Clay, the di- the day the laughter died was. Uh, I remember the first time I I listened to that. That was incredible. Him just bombing for an hour, <laughs> but <he> just, <laughs> and that's uh, yeah. And see, just and didn't care. Yeah, that stuff is so brave, dude. Like you know, going out and I mean, Jim Carrey would talk about that too when he did stand up. That like you know, he used to do impressions and he used to do really cute, you know, easily palatable stuff, and then he knew that that wasn't what he should be doing. So he threw out his whole act and he would just go out and just bomb, find the new identity of his comedy. And the fearlessness of that is like really tricky. Cause I, I know the pressure of I've bombed, you know, I've, I've, I've had some bad shows and when I, there are some venues I do where I got to do 45 minutes and I do my first seven minutes, which is supposed to be, you know, I try to front load my, my show to get everybody in the good, in a good mood. I, I put a lot of my, good stuff up front and they're not laughing. And I'm like, man, we got another 40 minutes of this. So, <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. Like, you know, let's just do it. You know, a, a fearlessness in that, uh, in trying to find what's funny, trying to find your act that I also, you know, really respect. And, and man, Enterdice Clay, when we were kids, that was contraband. Mm. We were not supposed to be listening to any of that. And hearing the way he would talk was just like, we were not supposed to be <laughs> listening to any of that stuff. And yet, it, looking back on it, it, like there's so many versions of, but that one and Eddie Murphy raw. Oh, raw and delirious. Oh my God. That, that stuff is just so edgy and so at the, at the time is yeah. just like, you know, so out there. But yet it's, it's really important. It's important for comedy to do that. He was a rock star, wasn't he? When he came out in the red suit and it was just, oh, yeah. it was ridiculous. Yeah. I, I love I love the Italian I love the Italian one in this in Raw when he's got the blue suit <laughs> and, and and all that stuff you know again and all that stuff really inspires us and I think that's something we're going to see with 
I think that's something we're going to see with Master Ken because to to Joe Conway's credit, um, he is usually the one tossing out the most controversial ideas to me, and I'm usually the one reining it in. Right. And I I am I have vowed to do that less often because um, I think we are at times I am doing a disservice to the comedy by trying not to upset people, and so you know, and then what kills us is like we back off of a, of a bit, right? And then we see it on SNL the next week. And I'm like, ah, oh. oh, man, we could have been first on that, you know, like uh, uh, because they're looking for the edge. And so uh, I, I think the new progression of Ken is definitely going to be much more outrageous um, and much braver in that sense. We've said some things that uh, have been pretty wild that martial artists can't believe we say. But I think it's safe to say that they haven't seen anything yet. Yeah, but you want to you want to keep the progression. You want to keep the edge. You want to keep that that intensity of you know what is he going to say? That was Howard Stern's big thing, isn't it? They want they they never knew what he was going to say next. Who hated him? They would listen, looking for stuff to get mad about. And so exactly, a, a kind of crazy strength in that of being like having people who like encouraging people who hate you to listen to your act too, just to get them get them riled up. Yeah, because they actually become fans. Was it Oscar Wilde who said you're judged by more by your enemies than your friends or something? It, very interesting. But I think it was you know that psychosis of they can they can actually read you as well. And the yep. th the thing with Howard Stern is that they were they both watched him whether they loved him or hated him. They both watched yep. him for the same reason. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think there's a, a really important lesson in that in, in in going with your instincts and and realizing that if people don't like your stuff, that's not the end of the world. Like I think that's a big fear with any artist or any storyteller or anybody who puts themselves out there, whether it's a YouTube show or a podcast or an actor or a writer or whatever, is like being. What if they don't like it? Yeah, screw it. You know, like at a certain point, you just have to say, screw it. I want to do it, and I want to make this, and I want to say this, and. Uh, and I, I've got to do it. If it's something that that com that I feel compelled to say or do, I got to do it, even if it's going to piss people off. Sure, I think that's one of the hardest things. Certainly, even when I started, was the, the facing fears. You know, not what are people going to think? What are they going to say? Am I doing this right? Am I doing it wrong? Could I be doing it this way or that way? And people like Brian Rose talk a lot about that, about teaching people how to to face those fears and, and using you know these social media platforms as a kind of vehicle to change people's psychology. I think it's it's very interesting the way the way things have progressed and the way it can actually help people. Absolutely. I mean, you know, and that's something, you know, we take a lot of pride in the fact that I do get, uh, I get messages from people who suffer from depression, people who, uh, you know, uh, soldiers who, uh, who wrestle with PTSD just send us messages saying, Hey, you know, I just wanted to say that like when I'm having a rough day, you know, your show, lightens the mood because uh, there's there's so much to be kind of it's a it's a crazy time the, the stuff we see in the news stuff we see in mm. politics stuff we see uh you know that's going on around the world that um uh it, it's important to have an outlet to be able to go and laugh and and uh to lighten things up because things can get so heavy so whenever we get any of those messages i feel even more encouraged to continue to do what we do. Yeah, I think comedy is a great way. It's a great vehicle, isn't it? It's a path to humanize quite serious things and actually bring them into a kind of context, you know, where everyone can understand. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, before we finish, Matt, I would just like to uh, maybe just progress onto your your films because I don't think a lot of people out there realize that you've you've actually been in quite a, a lot of feature films, haven't you? Yeah, the last the last few years have been have been uh, uh, some, brought some great opportunities. I, I got to to audition and uh, get uh, get roles in a few films that are out there, and uh, and because I don't always wear the mustache, uh, <laughs> people people oftentimes don't uh, don't recognize me. But um, uh, yeah, I, I've I've had some. Had some good roles. Like I had some fun. I got to work uh, with Tina Fey on uh, on Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, and uh, got to work uh, with the folks at uh, Scorch Trials, the Maze Runner Two. Uh, that was a that was a really fun gig. Okay. Um, you know, worked on a low budget action movie called uh, I don't know if I should say low budget, but it was like a straight to video kind of a thing, like a WWE studio uh, movie with Randy Orton called Condemned Part Two. Uh, nice. that was really fun. Cause you know, like, I, I love the action movies cause you get to run around and shoot guns and, yeah. you know, do, do, uh, fight choreography. We did that, uh, 
in a movie uh, called Odd Thomas, you know, that I did with the late uh, Anton Yelchin, who was a wonderful, wonderful actor. It was so wonderful to work with him. And I was just, uh, we were all, all of us who worked with him were so shocked to hear of his untimely death. And uh, working with him was such a delight. Him and Stephen Summers, we had so much fun uh, making Odd Thomas. And I'm oh. pretty sure that's still available on Netflix. I've had the good fortune of being in a place uh, that is good for film. New Mexico is a great place because mm. of its state incentives and its workforce and its studios to uh, to make your own films as well as uh, getting the opportunity to act in, in movies and television shows. Yeah, uh, Odd Thomas, The Guest, After the Fall, Vegas, The Prize. I mean, the, the list is, uh, you know, I'll put it in the show notes. A lot of people... I think don't realize how much stuff you've been involved with. And also the, I think the most recent one was maybe my pronunciation is wrong here, Matt. Sicario? Uh, Sicario. Sicario. Yeah. The Mexican yeah, man, cartels. Uh, Cause I just have, you know, I just got a couple of lines and I'm just in one scene, but it turned out that um, a still photo that was taken that they, uh, that had, it was, it was me sitting at a computer That's right. and I'm surrounded by Emily Blunt, Josh Brolin and Benicio del Toro. And they ended up using that photo to promote that movie all over the world. Yeah. And so people thought that I was like one of the st stars of the film. And I had to keep saying like, no, seriously, I'm in it for 30 seconds. I have <laughs> like, I have like two lines and then that's it. But like my picture with them went all over the place and it was such a happy accident because I just, you know, I just, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. And, yeah. and of course working, you know, working with Denis, the director and uh, Roger Deakins, who of course, one of the best living cinematographers out there um, was such a great experience, you know, just being in the room with such incredible talent and listening and learning and then ending up in a movie that's, that's, that was very well received critically. And, and now they're going to shoot a sequel of that movie. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's just great. I, I love those opportunities and I just take them as they come, you know, like uh, I have years where I uh, book a lot of those roles and then years that are slow. And, um, but it's always, it's always really fun to, to get to work with such talented people. Yeah. It was a great film. I loved it. So it's been, yeah, I mean, those, those types of, those types of gigs are great. And when I can get them, that's awesome. And, uh, and when I'm, uh, and in the meantime, I just make my silly little show and, and do my, my appearances and, and, uh, and enjoy that too. So I, you know, I just, I, I enjoy the process, whether I'm in, I, whatever, whatever version of it, it is, whether I'm just an actor on a, on another show or, uh, something I've created. Um, it's something I've always wanted to do since I was a kid and, and I'm doing it. And, do you, and so I couldn't hope for more. Do you, do you put yourself in a certain mindset when you're working with big people at like that big names? Do you, and what, and what is, how do you do that? Is, is there a certain method you get into to, you know, making the change from YouTube and one minute you're doing a, uh, you know, some of the other stuff and next minute you're in a, a massive Hollywood film. How do you, how do you approach it? You know, the two things I would say that are the trickiest is number one, um, like maintaining, like being polite, but professional, you know, like don't, I try not to, get too chatty. Cause I, you know, I know the people who are like super famous get that all the time and I don't want to, I don't, you know, I don't want to bother them. Mm -hmm. Um, but also being, you know, they, they will chat you up, you know, uh, Tina Fey would chat with us on the set. Um, Emily Blunt was the same. Josh Brolin is like one of the funnest guys to work with all the guys who are, he, they're, they're shooting another movie here right now. And I know a lot of friends who are on it and, um, Brolin is just one of the f most fun guys to work with. He's just a, he's just a fun guy. You know, yeah. he's real conversational, uh, really open to, to just being accessible to people. He's, he's really fun to talk to. And then the hardest part is in the scenes, you know, like the hardest thing that I, that I have to work on is like when I'm looking at an actor and like the camera's rolling is me not saying in my head, Holy you're really shit. famous. Holy shit. Yeah. yeah. I'm like looking at somebody and I like, all oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be in the moment and thinking about my character and thinking about the, what's happening in the scene. And there are times when I look over and I'm like, uh, <laughs> Emily Blunt's really famous. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have to like try to cut that out of my mind and be like, don't think about the fact that they're really famous. Think about the scene, you know, <laughs> and I, the set, you know, being, being on movies like that, I have to like kind of shake that loose. <laughs> but when you turned at the camera, Matt, when you were the, when you were the, the soldier, right. Looking at the monitor, you didn't, you did you didn't do a burn, but I thought you were almost for a second there. Oh man, it was tough, man. That lens was right up in our faces, dude. <laughs> I wanted to do it so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Who were your influences, Matt? And, uh, 
who you respected growing up and that have affected your your career? Gosh, there's so many. Um, you know, I was really influenced by all the uh, all the action stars of, of the uh, late '80s, early '90s. You know, like all the stuff that uh, Jean Claude Van Damme and and Dolph Lundgren and the mm-hmm. early Steven Seagal stuff, uh, and even guys, you know, like this the sort of uh, guys who were like in a subgenre, like Jeff Speakman and and uh, Billy Blanks and Don the Dragon Wilson, Cynthia Rothrock, like all those people. I certainly watched their movies and said, "Man, I would love to do martial arts in a movie someday. That would be really cool." Um, but then also just also comedy, you know, again like Chevy Chase. Um, the Three Stooges, um, you know, all that stuff growing up. Uh, and then uh, the film, you know, in terms of filmmaking, I, I love films. I love like dramatic films. I love uh, plenty of serious filmmakers like Paul Thomas Anderson, like Stanley Kubrick. Uh, wow. Wow, yeah. uh, I, I'm just a lover of, I just, I just love good work, you know? So when I'm watching, when I watch stuff, Sometimes I'll watch comedy, sometimes I'll watch martial arts, but other times I think, you know, I'm kind of always immersed in comedy and martial arts. So sometimes I'll shake it up and I'll watch Full Metal Jacket or I'll watch There Will Be Blood, you know, or I'll watch, you know, I'll watch something that is unique. I also, uh, I love horror films. Um, the reason working on the movie The Guest was such an awesome opportunity, I only had one line, again, I just was playing a firefighter as of a quick, a quick bit in that movie, but the director was named Adam Wingard. Right. And he uh, he worked on the VHS horror compilation series. Um, those nice. are really cool uh, horror compilations. Yeah. And uh, he also did a film called You're Next, which is a great horror film. And um, he's got, I'm, trying, I'm blanking on, he's got a couple of other really good films. He's one of my favorite filmmakers, him and Ty West yeah. and the guy who did the recent movie It Follows. There's like this really great, a group of horror filmmakers who are doing really awesome work um, mm. right now and kind of revitalizing the genre in their own way. Um, so yeah, they all they all really uh, they all really inspired me. Robert Zemeckis is probably one of my all time favorites. So ultimately, I would say the work of Robert Zemeckis from early stuff like Back to the Future, and then when he started uh, collaborating with a cinematographer named Don Burgess. When he did uh, that, he had this incredible run with Don Burgess where he did Forrest Gump, Contact, Cast Away, and What Lies Beneath, like all all in a row. And those were just like every film he came out with I loved more than the previous film. And um, he's a guy that I hope I luck out and get to work with someday because he's definitely probably at the top of my list ultimately. But, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of huge influences uh, that I've had. It's hard, hard to name them all, but uh, those are the ones that jump, jump to the forefront of my, uh, of my mind. I always remember the old Fangoria magazines growing up and uh, yeah. evil dead day, of the dead, you know, yeah. um, brain dead. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember that the uh that, that yeah, was... I, I, I have read that magazine and uh and i i definitely and i didn't discover the evil dead movies until i was in film school um but uh Fantastic. definitely made me a sam raimi fan and uh and love that stuff and and then the older stuff john carpenter is another guy I love his work man like yeah. i love you know the obvious ones like halloween oh. and, and christine and stuff but even some of the ones that like at the time didn't necessarily do as well, uh, like the fog. You know, right. I love the movie The Fog, wow. the original movie. Uh, Terri- like, uh, terrifying. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff, man. Like his style of, of filmmaking is just like I just love I love those movies, man. Like there's there's a lot of stuff that I really love that, that influences me, even if it's not the genre I work in. You know, I watch that stuff and I'm just I'm just inspired by good work. You know, I'm just inspired by yeah. the stuff that I like. Yeah, yeah. I was watching uh, the behind-the-scenes making of uh, Apocalypse Now, and you just see, you know, Francis Ford Coppola just just going insane. It's uh, oh, that's one of my okay. I, that's fantastic. crazy about that because that is one of my favorite all-time things. The Hearts of Darkness documentary, exactly. Met, is, filmed by his wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is one of my all-time. I didn't even know was, filmmaking could be like that. Yeah, you know what I mean. And I know that it kind of can't now. Like it's insane. Um, yeah, it's changed a lot. Like the studios have a lot more control, it seems, from the stuff I read. And it seems like that experience is, very, is probably not um, something that couldn't happen today. But that type of experience and his progression um, into madness <laughs> and then back yeah. out again and sort of the journey that he took everybody on in making Apocalypse Now, 
that Hearts of Darkness documentary is one of my all-time favorite anything that I've ever watched. Wow. It's incredible. And how incredible is it that at the end of that documentary that when he says the great hope is that um, with these at the time he was talking about high eight cam camcorders, but he's you know saying that these little camcorders will become higher and higher quality. And he said, I think the I think what he said is some fat girl in Ohio will become the new Mozart of film and that the professionalism of it will be kind of destroyed. And that is happening. That's absolutely happening. Like, like on the one hand, Hollywood movies are becoming bigger and bigger and more expensive, but the internet video and YouTube and Vimeo and people being able to film themselves and create their own videos and put it out directly to an audience is pretty much exactly what he predicted. Exactly. Yeah, how funny that is, man. I was watching that yesterday. Oh, that's <laughs> I I still have a copy of that. I actually have it on VHS. That's how long I've had that movie. <laughs> wow. Fantastic. If there was a book you had to buy for someone, what would it be? Oh, man, let's see. Um, you know, I like Sam Shepard. Um one of my favorite but one of my favorite things that he ever wrote was the Motel Chronicles. I think that's like just a kind of cool kind of cool book uh the book of five rings i've, I've actually given okay. that a couple times uh, yeah. the book of five rings yeah you know it's 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 kind of uh and then then for you know my my guilty pleasure just anything by stephen king you know i i i probably every book report i ever did in high school was on a stephen king book <laughs> that was that was all my favorite stuff and actually his short stories are my favorite thing i've always really been fascinated by the short form and i think that's right. why i made so many short films and and really enjoy episodic content online because I always loved how in just six or seven pages Stephen King could just terrify me, you know. Um, so books like Skeleton Crew, Nightmares and Dreamscapes, Everything's Eventual, um, a lot of his short form work is some of my some of my favorite stuff. I think my last question to you, uh, Matt, is going to be: if, Has anyone ever, because of the character, has anyone ever approached you and tried to fight you? Not, uh, <laughs> not really. Uh, although I did for the first time just recently, I did an appearance in Vegas and, uh, some little eight year old came up and kicked me square in the nuts. <laughs> <laughs> not for once. I was not wearing a cup. I like normally wear a cup with fit of, of master cannon. I really even had the thought of like, eh, I don't need one. It's not like someone's going to kick me in the nuts. And then some little eight year old walked right up and just like kicked me right, nice. did <laughs> right in the nuts. And I thought, yeah, I deserve that probably. Yeah, did, did the mustache <laughs> fall off? <laughs> right. No. And luckily, now the mustache is real. But you managed to stay in character. Yeah. Yeah. I, I stayed in character. Just looked down at him in, the, in, my, in my master Ken voice. I said, "You know, you're lucky. I conditioned that part of my body." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then his mother kind of looked at me in a strange way. Wow. <laughs> carted him away well matt i can't think of a better note to finish on that's been fantastic <laughs> talking about talking about your nuts yeah you know it's uh, the, the groin i've, I've be, my work has become more focused on the groin than i ever would have thought 